Thanks a lot for the introduction, Christoph. Happy to be here, to be part of this conference. Uh, it's always an amazing event, uh, especially talking to specialists and uh, people interested in energy storages. I'm Martin, one of the founders of Craftblock and CEO of Craftblock. Usually say I'm responsible for the creative part of high temperature energy storage technologies. To, so to see where they can be applied, how to use them, how to improve them uh, to have an impact uh, at the end. That's what we want to have at Craftblock. We really are aiming uh, for decarbonization of vital industries. Two or three words about Craftblock itself. Uh, Craftblock has been found in 2014. We started with a special materials development and systems design and entered the market officially one and a half years ago. So starting with the commercialization, commercialization of our products. Meanwhile, the team grew to 30 team members and still is growing over this year. So um, just a shout out if there's a very strong skilled engineer in the audience, happy to get applications for this. So short, short remark at this point in, um, in time. But now uh, let's de dive deep into the topic or a little bit deeper into the topic. Uh, when we talk about craft block, we usually call ourselves a multifunctional high temperature energy storage system. Craft block in a nutshell, everything put together in one sentence. What do, does, uh, do I mean with that? High temperature for us means we can store up to 1,300 degrees C. We need not do this because also be 300, 500, 800 degrees C. We set our systems limit to 1,300. On materials perspective, we could even take more temperature, but say, okay, most of the application we aim for are lower than 1,300 degrees C. So let's cap the whole system at this point uh, in time and maybe extend it in the future. If we store, and I think I do not have to explain it very well, at 1,000 degrees C, we could also discharge at 200 degrees C or 150 degrees C. So that's quite independently from the, uh, from the temperature profile and the energy I store in our storage system. We call it meanwhile storage system because we, of course, add charging and discharging devices to the storage itself so that the customer usually gets a turnkey application. One important remark, uh, which is quite different to most of the players we have seen so far in the market, our storage is really just a storage. It's a smart storage system, uh, but it's just a storage. So we did not integrate any heat exchanger, any heating cartridges, any valves, any flaps, no moving parts. It's really just a storage because this gives us the opportunity to operate with charging discharging station to cover the multifunctional part, which means for our storage, it's independent where the heat is coming from or the energy is coming from. Is it waste heat from steel, glass, ceramics industry, uh, petrochemical industry or other industries? Or do you use uh, renewables, whether renewable thermal or even renewable electricity using power to heat system converted to heat and store this uh, in our storage device at the end? Uh, the same for the discharging side. What type of energy uh, does the customer need? Is it electricity? Not our preferred case usually, but there are some, some opportunities for electricity production. Um, mostly for us, it's heat. In, in this term, we can discuss which type of heat. Is it just hot air? Is it, um, um, is it a thermal oil? Is it steam? What is needed by the customer? We can adjust uh, a discharging device. And very important, all those components we need for charging and discharging are out of the shelf components. So nothing newly developed, really state of the art. You can find it in tons of references in the market, which means also reducing the product risk uh, for our customer. At the end, we do a quite smart engineering about the whole system. So we get the maximum efficiency in uh, what's very important, mostly for brownfield applications in a very, very small uh, local footprint uh, directly on site. And that helps our customers um, usually a lot. If you take a closer look to the storage itself, um, it consists out of a couple of components, uh, of course. So we started with a materials development. Uh, when we thought about uh, thermal energy storage at that point in time, uh, our personal benchmark was the concrete storage uh, at that time developed by DLR Zyplin. I found it quite nice. I mean, concrete, easy to apply. You find it everywhere in the world. You can cast it in every shape. But they said it's a high temperature storage. Um, I was working in steel industry at that point in time and 500 degrees C, sorry, it's just warm up temperature. It's not high temperature. That's why uh, we started thinking about what does high temperature energy storage means? What should such a storage device be able to cover? Um, and we started with the materials development. Uh, in the materials development, we had two important factors uh, on our agenda. One is sustainability because we want to be an impact company. 
sustainability for us means take a look on disposal sites. What materials are available over there? Which materials can you take back to a circular economy at the end? And the technical side, of course, you need a strong capacity, a very good capacity, ideally a quite constant capacity uh, for high temperature energy storage. But on the other hand, you also need a good uh, heat conductivity in order to follow technical processes because you should not have latency times like five minutes, 10 minutes, uh, 30 minutes uh, in, in a lot of those processes. The reaction times have to be quite fast. And that's why we combined materials, for example, steel slag is one of the raw materials, one out of four we are using for our storage device with a special type of binder, which is a phosphatic binder that gives us a couple of, um, uh, let's say, additional uh, re re requirements that we could fulfill. One is it sticks together the powders, it takes the conductivity into the system, and it even forms a kind of protective shell on top of those pellets. Um, and pellets is just one shape. Usually we're using the pellets at the moment, but could also be a prick-like system or even honeycomb system based on the same material. Uh, we tested, of course, this material quite intensively. That's why it took quite a long time to, to approach the market, which means not only, let's say, conductivity uh, heat, uh, capacity, but also cycling behavior between 200 and 1,000 uh, uh, degrees C, um, uh, charging, discharging with different types of flue gas to see if there's any chemical corrosion on the material itself, what's the influence of the material on different heat transfer media. Of course, also mechanical properties, because if you think about... Uh, large scale storage is 20 meter in the height, the pellets should be stable even if you pour 25 meter on, on top of it. Uh, so this was also taken into account and you can see the, the core team was material development and, and uh, chemists and uh, material scientists. Um, then we designed the storage system around our, our storage material itself to figure out a couple of additional, um, let's say benefits uh, of the mechanical combination with the thermal combination, we ended up with a modular system based on 10, 20, and 40 foot containers. Uh, so typical uh, standard transport containers. Reason for that, quite simple. You can easily prefabricate them in the production line. You can transport them by each truck, by each train, by each ship, if you like. So, so also getting, uh, making it easier uh, to transport it to the construction site. And the third reason, if you transport the containers, why shouldn't you use those containers as a mobile heat storage? So we charge it in one place, transport the heat uh, to another place and release it over there. Additionally, you get a kind of, let's say, Lego block system to build large scale storages based on the same models you're using for small uh, scale solutions. Um, sounds pretty simple. There's a lot of technology, a lot of know-how in. Uh, I will not deep uh, dive deep into this, this part of the technology. Uh, but that works out quite fine. At the end, of course, um, the carbon dioxide footprint and life cycle assessment for our storage device itself was all highly interesting to us. Uh, we do have definitely a very small footprint, uh, which is like 180 kilogram carbon dioxide per megawatt hour of storage, mit of storage put on place, uh, which is mainly due to the fact that um, recycled materials get rated to nearly no carbon dioxide at, uh, when you use it. So the perfect point to step in. Um, then we start developing the whole energy system. Energy system, as I described, means how to charge the storage, how to discharge the storage uh, in order to enter different markets. Of course, we did, as, as all the companies and universities, did a lot of prototypes, a, kind, a couple of pilots. At this point, Yes, you could charge the storage also directly with a thermal oil or molten salt. We are also together with well-known uh, research institutes in, in trial runs uh, with those heat uh, transfer media. Usually, if we talk about high temperature, we charge by any type of gas. Could be a flue gas, could be air, could be halogen, uh, helium, could be nitrogen, carbon dioxide. What's available and sufficient for this uh, type of use case? Um, very short glance to the market. Um, these are quite, quite present figure, I think, from uh, 2019. Yes, there are the heat consumption worldwide in petawatt hours. Um, let's not discuss about the units, but at the end, the heat demand globally is roughly 50% of the energy demand uh, if you add uh, electricity and if you add uh, fuels, which is quite impressive. And we have seen uh, by a couple of studies that especially, especially industrial heating will even grow till 2050 by another 
Probably the reason behind is quite simple. We do have a lot of uh, upcoming countries, a lot of emerging uh, emerging countries that also will have, want to have uh, wealth in future. In order to have wealth, you need steel, you need glass, you need ceramics, you need chemicals, you need a lot of clothes and a couple of other goods. And for all of them, you need heat to produce it. That's why uh, the, the process heat will increase in future and not decrease. For the housing sector, the forecasts are quite different. Uh, they say uh, decreasing demand of heat. Another reason for us was to say, if we can decarbonize just one company, we have a higher impact than decarbonizing 8,000 private homes. Of course, not neglecting that it's not important, but uh, as an impact company, you want to have a fast impact. Uh, and I mean, we do not have to talk about uh, the, the climate change at this point in time. Um, but that's that's the background. For us, mostly, uh, you can go through the figures in the middle. You needn't go. Uh, it's more or less how um, temperature or uh, temperature profiles higher than 400 degrees C are produced. Usually, uh, there is still a lot of gas and a lot of coal in usage, roughly 80%. Uh, for medium temperature, 100 to 400 degrees C, you have roughly 50%, which is still produced by fossils. And we want to have to get rid of this uh, of those processes. That's why we split it, our system into what we call waste heat recycling system. So you have existing ovens, kilns, furnaces that are operating uh, already in, in different industries. And they do have waste heat. They do have a flue gas. And if you take a very close look to the whole process, usually if you fire your ceramics at 1,200 degrees C, you do have 1,000 degrees C in the flue gas line before the annulite gap. Then you dilute it with ambient air to do your waste heat uh, purification. Uh, but why not recover the heat before doing the purification? That's what our waste heat recycling uh, system is designed for. For lower temperatures, we see a great opportunity, and that's also the response from the market, to introduce a net zero heat system. Net zero heat for us means replace fossil fuels against renewable energies. Uh, usually in Europe, we talk about renewable electricity. So the idea is to um, convert electricity to heat for only a few hours every day when the electricity prices are small and supply the process demand uh, of the industries from the storage 24-7, ideally. There could also be a mix out of two models, but um, for us, it doesn't play any role, uh, especially as the storage device itself. It's the, it's the same for both applications. Of course, we also have to, uh, and I will also not discuss those figures in detail. Uh, these figures are taken out of from the uh, McKinsey Elders uh, Net Zero Heat Report, uh, just also benchmarked with our technology. Uh, we also have to take a look what are the alternative technologies that could be used. On the left side, we have a typical gas boiler, uh, also including carbon dioxide emissions, so pricing mostly um, for Europe or those countries who have already carbon dioxide pricing. We can combine it with carbon capture storage, which is already quite nice. Hydrogen could be a nice idea for a lot of applications, but actually it isn't just uh, also because of the efficiency losses. Biomass boilers are a good alternative if there is enough biomass available and you do not have to plant it, especially to operate the biomass boilers. Then it could be a, a paradox as well. And electrifying at the moment, you could do it by an electric boiler. In this case, in this, this use case, we're talking about steam generation, uh, should, should have this remark. Um, but you would have to extend it, for example, by a lithium battery and then uh, just levelized costs of heat uh, per megawatt hour of steam are getting quite, quite high and probably industries won't invest in that. If we combine our system with an electric boiler or even with a power to heat system and discharge from our system, we have quite competitive prices, even to gas boilers plus um, carbon dioxide emissions. Let's not talk about this in detail. You all know graphics like this. And uh, just to figure out, we do have different storage solutions for the market. We have different temperatures. We have different storage durations. And we see craft block starting from 200 degrees C, not necessarily 100 degrees C, 200 degrees C up to 1,300 degrees from a few hours till maximum. And this is for all special use cases, maximum two weeks of storage duration. Usually at the use cases we cover so far, few hours till two days. That's the cycling time for our storage device at the moment. What did we do so far? And uh, that's what I will end up. Um, we are operating in different industries. Meanwhile, one, our eldest uh, system, it's, it was a pilot. Now it's fully under operation uh, in, in commercial sense. 
built in the ceramics. We recover heat from a flue gas stream and a batch driven furnace. We store it, release it the day after as preheating the oven. So a kind of, of shifted recuperator at the end. But this helps our customer to save 15 to 70 percent of, of gas, uh, which is quite important for them in a very simple step. The green container looks slightly different, but just because this customer owns a fleet of 80 trucks, I guess, who can transport, which can transport those containers. So it was easier for us to reconfigure the inner layout uh, than for him to buy a couple of new trucks. In this case, we recover the heat from a small CHP, a biomass CHP, which is not um, not attached to any district heating system. So there is a new business model even for, for biomass plants or for uh, waste heat disposal services. Works out quite fine. So it's a mobile system. The other two in steel industry, one of the projects recovering waste heat at the Sintercooler as a backup system for the Sintercooler production project in India. The other steel project is in Germany, where we recover flare gases uh, at 1300 degrees C, store it in a mobile system in a very first step with roughly eight megawatt hours transported to the final customer, release the heat over there. Then after this testing period, we'll step up to a 300 megawatt hour storage solution. So the first step is even covered by a Horizon 2020 uh, funding from the European Union. In terms of electricity, last point, we are uh, we are executing a project with Eneco PepsiCo in the Netherlands to decarbonize their lace chip, chips production. Idea, as I explained it, uh, charted by electricity for four hours every day when the electricity prices are low, deliver energy 24-7 from the storage device to the process um, to fry the lace potato chips at the end, which means in the final stage would be 150 megawatt hour storage uh, decarbonization by 98%, which is a quite good step, uh, especially for an impact company. I don't explain this slide. Uh, at the end, we at Craftwork, we developed an, a storage system which is extremely flexible, even from the storage device itself, but also from the applications. It's modular. We do have a lifetime higher than 20 years, of course, and we have a, a very, quite, quite strong life cycle, life cycle assessment to, to fulfill all uh, sustainability demands. So I think I'm quite good in time. Thanks a lot for your attention and happy about the discussion later. So um, this presentation is about Impact Test Network, which uh, together with uh, Professor Luisa Cabeza from the University of Lleida in Spain, we are coordinating uh, this network that I will briefly explain in this, in this session. So uh, here you can see the contents of my presentation. I will start with a brief history or background of the network. I, then I will present very briefly the partners and the objectives and the activities of the network, such as the learning platform and the students enrollment in this platform. And I will end up with uh, conclusions. So let's start with a bit of motivation and background for, for this network. Um, in 2014, this um, education and training roadmap was published by the European Commission, in which uh, the training of skilled professionals in the field of thermal energy storage technologies was uh, highlighted as of great importance. And uh, also in that roadmap, uh, also clear gaps and needs for more efficient education at um, PhD level was identified in the field of thermal energy storage. So that um, roadmap um, allowed us to prepare and submit a proposal, which was successful in the form of a, a European project, which was called PhD on Innovation Pathways for Thermal Energy Storage, or briefly Impact Test, um, which was launched in May 2015. And it had a duration of three years. The type of project yeah. was uh, coordination and support action. Uh, it was coordinated by our University of Lleida. So what was the main goal of that uh, project? Uh, it was quite ambitious. So we uh, wanted to create a network of universities, research centers, um, industry, to implement a PhD program on thermal energy storage technologies. So uh, specifically, uh, the idea was to develop at least 20 
credits of basic common training, but also to develop four uh, common technology PhD courses, so more specialized on this uh, thermal energy storage topic. But apart from this, um, there were also um, annual workshops organized for PhD students, and we aim to graduate at least 28 students every year. And moreover, the idea was to exchange at least 14 PhD students every year between industry and academia. So the idea was to, to strengthen the collaboration between universities and companies from the industry. Well, um, after the, the project ended in 2018, uh, we decided to continue and we established as a way to continue this collaboration, uh, we founded, we created the Impact Test Network. Most of the partners of that project uh, decided to continue, but since then uh, some changes occurred. Some few members of the network um, would well, had to leave the, the network, but some other came in. So right now, today, we have 17 partners from 12 European countries, as you can see here from Spain, Switzerland, Italy, Israel, Austria, Poland, Netherlands, Belgium, uh, UK, Ireland, France, and Portugal. So we are quite spread around, around uh, Europe. So uh, now as a network, our main objective uh, was or is to foster cooperation among universities, research institutes, and companies to develop quality learning material uh, for education and training of professionals in the field of thermal energy storage. I have to say at, the, at this point that, unfortunately, the, the objective of the project, Impact Test Project, was probably too ambitious. And because of uh, legal barriers, differences in the, in the legislation related to teaching or to PhD studies in different countries in Europe, that Mm, goal, that objective to implement a uh, joint PhD was, was unfortunately not possible, but we still managed to, to continue this collaboration by doing uh, PhDs in co-tutel or joint uh, supervisions of PhD students. So one of our main activities is to develop, maintain and update the learning material developed within the project uh, to keep doing joint supervisions of PhD students or co uh, to exchange students between industry and academia, but also within different research institutes or universities, and to organize annual workshops or training schools. Um, we also decided to establish two types of membership within this network. Uh, on the first um, side, let's say, on the one side is the uh, core partners, which um, in this category, all the partners of the European project uh, enter here directly. So the core partners have some privileges, like free access to all the learning material. They are represented in the general board of the network, and they have priority or reduced fees for the participation in the network activities like training schools and also uh, each uh, core partner should um, pay a membership fee but it, this is reduced so it's only 1000 euros per year but they also have some obligations like commitment to create to maintain to review part of the learning material on the other side we have associate partners which uh, must pay the full membership fee, which is 2,000 euros per year. But in turn, they have some other advantages of being uh, associate partners, like free and full access to the learning material, but they don't have the obligation to maintain or to create learning material. Of course, they can do it if, if they want. <laughs> so at this point, I would like to encourage all of you all of the people that attend this, this session to become an associate partner. After uh, a time and after some um, requirements are fulfilled, uh, each associate partner can become a core partner. 
So requirements to become an associate partner, if you come from academia or research centers, you have to have published at least five scientific journal papers in the last five years, or to have participated in at least two funded national or international projects in the last five years, or to have at least two PhD students graduated in the last five years in topics related to thermal energy storage. For institutions from industry, the requirements are to have participated in at least one funded project in the last five years, or to have at least one product or activity related to, to the topic. So I will present now um, the learning platform that we developed during the project and afterwards. So all the learning material uh, was implemented in an online learning platform which uh, is based on the Sakai learning management system that we use at the University of Lleida, also for the uh, students, for the, all the students. So here you can see a, a snapshot of this uh, learning platform. Um, here we have a unique selection of learning material that can be grouped or, and was grouped in a total of 14 courses that I will explain later. Each course is divided in several small pieces, which we called lessons. Um, and a certificate is issued for each small piece, for each lesson that the students successfully pass. Uh, to pass a lesson, the students need to uh, take an assessment of the lesson and to fulfill with the minimum requirements. So um, here I will briefly present you the, 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 the courses. So uh, as I said before, we developed more than 20 ECTS, so more than minimum required within the project of basic common PhD courses, uh, which are research and PhD. So very for beginners, for people that start their PhD. Then we have a course, a basic course, course on introduction to thermal energy storage another one on thermal energy storage materials, testing and characterization of thermal energy storage materials, and a course on heat and mass transfer and sizing of energy storage devices. Then we have the um, block of courses that we usually call soft skills, which are uh, introductions to intellectual property, property and patenting ideas. Then we have courses on idea to product development, dissemination and communication of research, funding of research and project management, and management and entrepreneurship. So these courses, some of them were developed thanks to the uh, involvement in, in the project of partners like Kik Inno Energy. And um, finally, the third block is uh, specialization courses where we have thermal energy storage applications for buildings. We have demand side management concepts and energy storage. We have large scale and industrial thermal energy storage and one course on energy policy and market development. Uh, let me now briefly explain how students can enroll in this platform. So on the one side, uh, a student, can enroll in the PhD program. So what does it mean? That the students have the possibility to enroll in this co-tutel. So they must find two partners, university partners, and enroll in both of their uh, PhD programs at each of the university. And the university, for, of course, they should be members of impact test. So, um, they will have then free access to the impact test learning material, to all the material as students of the, the network. On the other side, uh, anybody, any people from academia, researchers, or people that work in companies in the industry can also register through the online uh, web of the network. Uh, so they can choose the lessons they are interested to take and then they must pay some fees depending on the number of um, credits selected and also depending on the student profile. If it's from academia or if it's from a big company or a small company, 
if it's from EU, EU or non-EU. And scholarships may also be granted to students from developing countries. So again, we encourage you to, to take a look at the website and see if you are interested in any lesson. So this gets me to the conclusion of my presentation which I hope it was not uh, too long. So um, the Impact Test Network was created in 2018 with the main objective to educate and train professionals in the field of thermal energy storage. But you can see that we also have materials related to soft skills. Uh, an institution interested can become first an associate partner, and then after some time, uh, it can become core partner of the network. And the main advantages of being associate partner are that uh, you can have free and full access to the learning material and no obligations with uh, the learning material. So as a general final conclusion, an individual from academia, research institutes or companies can register for any of the lessons in exchange of paying the registration fees. So I would like to thank the European Commission for the help or the funding received for the creation of the network and to all the partners. And before I finish, I would like just to <laughs> let you know that you are still on time to register for the next Eurotherm conference seminar that will take place in at the end of May in, in here in Lleida, in Spain. We are organizing it. So please save the date from 24th to 26th of May. You can still send submit your abstract until the end of uh, february so i hope if you have not registered yet i hope you can register and see you here in jada so thank you very much for your attention and waiting for your questions at the end of the the session thank you all right thank you very much christoph i'll try the screen sharing now so, does Looks it work? Good. Yes. Okay, perfect. Then, yeah, thank you very much for having me today. Um, yeah, my name is Norma Kemper. I work for the company called uh, GP Jewel. And um, this company actually exists already since 2009. And we're coming from the, um, yeah, from, from um, developing projects in uh, um, the, sector of um, photovoltaic and wind. So we started with uh, building huge wind parks in the north of Germany and uh, also PV power plants um, all around in Germany. So the biggest one that we have um, on the grid at the moment is the 300 megawatt PV power plant um, in an area closer to Berlin. And uh, yeah, also there are huge wind farms in the north of Germany, as I said already. And uh, yeah, this is where we're actually coming from, from renewable energies. And um, yeah, the big question is how we get to green hydrogen. I mean, everyone knows green hydrogen is produced by um, using renewable energies for the electrolyzers. And um, we actually started focusing on that um, on that specific field of producing green hydrogen, because as you may know, the grid in Germany is not that um, yeah, it's already at max capacity. So we had to find solutions how to store all that energy that we are producing. So at a very early stage, we already said, okay, the only way or the way that makes sense for us is um, to store that energy that we produce um, by producing green hydrogen. So that was the topic. And that's why um, I can represent to you our best practice example today, which is the e-farm. So the e-farm is um, the largest green hydrogen mobility project that is in operation at the moment, and it's located in um, North Frisia. Um, and this, this project is um, a best practice example for um, the regional, um, um, yeah, the, the regional idea of uh, producing the energy, um, store the energy and then use the energy exactly in that area. So um, in the area where everything is produced. Um, so 
let me tell you a little bit more about our e-farm, a short overview. As I said, it's the largest green hydrogen mobility project in operation. And um, we have two hydrogen filling stations in the north of Germany. Um, so as you can see, the hydrogen filling stations, it's like a normal, it looks like a normal gas station. So we decided that when we produce the green hydrogen, um, we want to make it usable for the mobility sector because uh, this is this is the sector where we thought is, uh, has the most potential for using green hydrogen in a fast process. So besides these uh, two hydrogen filling stations, we've got five production sites for the hydrogen. And all the production sites are always located at our wind parks in the north of Germany. So we have very short ways from the production site to, um, so from the energy production site to the production site where the hydrogen is produced. And then also we have um, the filling stations close by. So the transport, um, ways are very short between the production sites and then um, the filling stations. Um, at the moment we have a, a total output of more than one megawatt and um, the special thing about this uh, e-farm is that we use the hydrogen to um, make the buses run for the public transportation system in the north of Germany. So as you can see, it's like a circular um, economy that we're trying to implement here. Also, there are already like around 60 or even more, I think now, uh, 60 fuel cell cars that are in private use which is very special because as you may know, there are not so many fuel cell cars uh, on the market at the moment. Um, and this is uh, because of this e-farm, the number of private, um, private fuel cell cars um, just got bigger and uh, rise because uh, we actually provide the green hydrogen. And uh, this is why the people invest in fuel cell cars, which is very special um, in Germany at the moment. Um, also, we have uh, seven mobile storage devices. So the way we get the green hydrogen to the filling stations is via um, the trailers. It's a trailer system. So we produce the hydrogen at the um, wind parks and then we pump it into the trailers and then the trailers deliver that green hydrogen to the filling stations. So here you can see again the um, value chain that I already um, explained a little bit. So you can see the um, production side of the green hydrogen. This um, are the electrolyzers and also the compressors at the wind park. So they compress the green hydrogen to make it uh, fit into the trailers. And this is the transport system that you can see. So in these trailers, um, we store the green hydrogen and then we distribute it to our um, hydrogen um, filling stations. And here we have always two um, dispensers, two hydrogen dispensers at the filling stations. One is for the cars and the other one is for um, heavy duty vehicles like trucks because they need a different kind of pressure. So the pressure for the um, for the cars is 700 bar that you need to uh, fill them up with green hydrogen and uh, for trucks and heavy duty vehicles it's 350 bar and then of course in the like the last in the value chain are the buses that um, like run every day on a daily uh, schedule in the public transportation system and they come twice a day to fill up with the green hydrogen again so let's zoom in a bit. This is the um, bird's perspective of our green hydrogen production site. It's in Bosbühl, very, very small town in North Frisia. It's already close, close to Denmark. It's almost, almost Denmark already. <laughs> this is why we have a lot of wind and this makes sense. Um, so yeah, here you see the electrolyzers and this is the compressor and um, they follow the, the pipeline system and go into the trailers here. So this is our, these are actually the storage devices that we use, the trailers. So you see that you don't really need that much space to produce hydrogen. It's, I think, around a thousand square meters, and that's it. Then we have a closer look at the trailer system. Um, these trailers, uh, 
have a, um, a dispenser and a compressor system to um, yeah, get that hydrogen into the trailers. They need a little bit, um, the, the pressure has to be a little bit higher when the hydrogen goes into the trailers. And then when it's delivered at the refilling station, um, the pressure has to be a little bit higher to get that um, hydrogen in the, in the vehicles in the end. Yeah, here's a closer look at the refilling station, which actually looks quite normal. Nothing really <laughs> out of the ordinary. It looks like a normal gas filling station. Um, just a little bit nicer design, to be honest. So how does this actually work, this e-farm? We, as uh, GP Jewel, we always thought very locally. And we also act locally. So the energy that we produce in our wind parks and also in our PV power plants um, is always meant to be used um, locally as well. And we always um, focus on a local value chain for the region itself. Um, so as I said, we have the wind in the north and um, we harvest and make use of this 100% renewable energy that we have. So also the hydrogen that you can uh, buy from the, from the filling stations is always 100% green. So this is very special because all the other refilling stations in Germany cannot guarantee that the hydrogen they sell is 100% um, green hydrogen. So yeah, this is, uh, this is one unique selling point of GPG. Then we also convert on-site. As I said before, the green hydrogen is for the regional value creation. And um, we always want to make use of everything that we produce, even though what other people may call the waste. <laughs> so um, what kind of waste do we have at a hydrogen production site? We've got heat. So we also make use of the heat. Um, sorry, this is in German on this, on this uh, slide, but I think you still understand. So we have the renewable energies, um, we have the electrolyzer. So this is where the hydrogen is produced. And like one of the waste, waste products actually is the heat. So we can make use of that heat to, um, to um, fill that in the, in the heating system of smaller towns and uh, municipalities. So in the end, we can use the green hydrogen for the mobility sector, but also for the heating sector. And in the end, of course, also for smaller industry. Um, but this is a topic that we focus on in the future and is not in use at the moment at the e-farm. At the e-farm, we definitely focus on the mobility sector. So here you can see the network where this e-farm is actually located and um, how it is in use. So you see the um, hydrogen production sites always located at the wind park. So for example, Reusenköge is where our headquarter is. It's a very, very small town. <laughs> There's almost nothing around other than wind uh, windmills. Then we have another production site in Dörpum and one in Langenhorn and one in Börsbühl. And, uh, from these production sites, we distribute the green hydrogen to the gas filling stations, one in Husum and one in Nibel. And between these two hydrogen um, filling stations, the buses run on the public transportation system. So the e-farm is our best practice example because um, it can be a blueprint for success. It is very easily accessible for other areas. So wherever you have a wind farm, you can produce green hydrogen. As I, show, as I showed you before, it's, uh, you don't need that much space for a hydrogen production site. You just need the, um, the energy source which has to be a renewable energy source because we want it to be green hydrogen. And um, yeah, this is, a, this is a very successful blueprint. And here's a little uh, short history of um, how we uh, got into the market with the e-farm. So we actually started with the um, project development in 2018. And uh, after two years of the development, we could um, already 
do the inauguration of the green hydrogen production plant in Bosbühl. Of course, we got uh, funding from the government. So we invited the Federal Minister of Transport and Digital Infrastructure at that time in 2020. It was Andreas Scheuer. So, um, yeah, we were very uh, happy to have the um, support from the from the government to also have this sign that they are ready to um, yeah to transform into a renewable energy system and uh, think locally and act locally together with us with Gibijo. Then in 2020, we also won the German Renewables Award with the E Farm. So this is why it's a really good best practice example and we're very proud of it um, and then in 2021 we could do another public inauguration of the second filling station in uh, Husum and Nibel and uh, also a big success for us was in 2022 when we won the German Mobility Award in the category of change because as you may notice now we got a really um, innovative system here it's uh, new and uh, unique in Germany and uh, around the globe so yeah this is um, a big success story for us and um, yeah I'm, I'm very, very happy that I was able to present this um, this e-farm project to you today because I think it's a very important step in uh, the whole question about energy storage which is very important at the moment um, and green hydrogen is definitely one of the very um, useful and very um, yeah necessary uh, mediums that we can use for for energy storage solutions. Thank you very much for your presentation and the overview um, and insights into the Green Hydrogen Mobility Project. Um, very interesting as well. Thank you. So now it's time for um, the Q&A session with all the um, session speakers, which I uh, welcome back to the uh, virtual stage. So we already have some questions in the Q&A. Uh, box. Um, so the audience is still uh, encouraged to add their questions there. The other possibility is to raise your digital hand, then we can um, uh, give you the, the, let's say, the rights to, uh, to speak up directly. But let's start with the questions in the Q&A section. So um, the first one is to Martin from Kraftblock. The question is if the system is to be optimized based on energy efficiency or exergy efficiency. <laughs> for, for both at the end, uh, it, it's really a good question. Let's say technically it's it's more for exergy efficiency uh, against the customer. It's usually energy efficiency because they don't split into energy exergy. Uh, the, the most important fact is what does the, the, the energy uh, whether it's levelized cost of, of, of storage or levelized cost of heat in this case is what does it cost compared to other solutions? Um, internally, the storage itself, uh, we, we optimize for the exergy, of course. Okay, thank you. Um, I assume that this is answered and we'll go to the, um, to the next question. This is for Gabriel. Um, Gabriel, you also can see it. So the question is, if the government and the EU has been uh, made aware of these legal barriers you mentioned, and um, if there are maybe um, ideas how to uh, solve it and how to improve this in the future, I think it was on the um, shared PhD um, program. Yes, thank you. Thank you for, for the question. Yeah, it's, it's a good question because... Um, Actually, yeah, during the, the project within one of the work packages, we actually started to, to see what, what are the problems, what are the barriers, what needs to be done, what is missing. So we finally, based on all this work that we carried out, we were able to uh, prepare uh, several deliverables that we submitted to the European Commission so they are aware of, of this, but it's true that we could not contact directly with the politicians or policymakers, the relevant one. So it's very difficult to, to get to them. We did 
organize some breakfast meeting or event in, in Brussels with some representatives from the Directorate General related to, to this, and we explain them and inform the this the situation. So we hope that through through them and through these reports that we deliver to the European Commission, they mm, pass the information to, to the policymakers. We hope so, but mm -hmm. we could not contact directly with the with the ones that can change this. I see. Yeah, yeah. So, but as you mentioned, the, the network is still alive. At least most of the participants are still active. So, you, uh, yeah, we will, I assume we will go on to 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 deal with this challenge and, and to, uh, yeah, to work on this in the future, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. We don't yeah. leave this goal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Wow. Now, many questions are coming in. Um, so there are a few questions to Norma. Um, first one is how much uh, energy in relation to the energy content of the hydrogen is used for compression? And then a follow-up question on the pressure the electrolyzers are operating. Yeah, well, thank you. These are very technical questions. <laughs> yes. I would like to forward them to our technical team because I can actually not answer them. Um, I can tell you how much um, energy we need to put into the electrolyzers to um, to get out the green hydrogen. So it's a um, relation of one to two. So um, with the e-farm, we had like a very small scale system, actually, um, because it's already kind of old. <laughs> um, and now we have uh, a lot more production sites um, and new projects developing um, all over Germany. And the, um, the minimum uh, capacity of the production sites that we have there is two megawatt. And we have to, um, yeah, we have to put in like four to five megawatt of energy to get out two megawatts of hydrogen. maybe doesn't precisely answer the question, but this is everything I can tell you. I can forward the question if it's really necessary to our technical team and then get the answers for you ready afterwards. Okay. So uh, yes, maybe that's a, a good idea and a general remark. So if someone from the audience um, later on uh, has a question, then we can of course offer the possibility that you uh, send your question to the um, the STCP Secretariat mail address, you should probably have that, and we can then forward it to the corresponding um, speakers of the conference. Mm. So maybe now we take a question from the audience. There's one raised hand. Ah, Andreas, please. I have to first give you the speaking permission right now. Yes, please. <laughs> now we can hear you. Now, now you can hear me? Okay, great. So first, I, I want to thank all, all the speakers. Very excellent presentations. Um, uh, I have a question to Norma. Um, I, I presented your project in, in several occasions, so uh, I like it very much. And I think it's, it's a real game changer that we are now able to produce energy for mobility on a local level. So that is really different from everything we uh, experienced in the past. Um, my question is, um, you presented now this, this, this hydrogen solution for public transportation. And I know that GP Joule is also active in, in e-mobility, electricity-driven vehicles. So where do you see the, the uh, let's say, the application for hydrogen? And where do you see more uh, application for electric vehicles? Yeah, thanks for that question. It's a very really important question, to be honest. Um, so, of course, we have uh, one business unit that is also focusing on uh, e-mobility. So we're um, we're building a charging system all over Germany as well for um, battery electric uh, cars. So that's uh, that's another thing we do because we just produce so much renewable energy. So it's uh, making sense for us to do that as well. Um, I think the big difference in the end is that we um, focus with the usage of green hydrogen um, on the heavy duty uh, industry. So um, we're also focusing on um, emission free transportation at the moment. 
Um, you may also have heard about the project um, that is um, going on at the moment for um, for a kind of leasing model for trucks. So now that we have the green hydrogen and also have the refueling stations, um, we also gonna bring the truck into the market as well. So um, in the near future, you'll be able to also um, rent or lease the trucks from us, like fuel cell trucks um, that use the green hydrogen as a fuel. So I think this is the big difference that for like private uh, vehicles and smaller cars, it definitely makes sense to um, still go for the battery electric um, vehicles and mobility. Um, and for the heavy duty vehicles and the transportation sector, we think that the green hydrogen is definitely the solution to um, yeah, reach the climate targets and also get, uh, get the whole sector emission free. Thank you very much. Um, now I would combine two technical questions to Martin. So one is on the lowest temperature at which your system could work. I mean, yeah, it's technical, but also an economical question, of course. And the second one is about the installation of the containers. Um, yeah, a bit about the, the detail and maybe about the potential loss could be especially mm -hmm. interesting for the, the application for up to two weeks of uh, storage period. Yeah, uh, wonderful questions, both of them. So lowest temperature we tested was minus 196 degrees, uh, was more because of temperature change resistance of the storage material, uh, less than a store cold at the end. Uh, let's say in, in a practical way, we recommend our customers to use our storage starting from storage temperatures, uh, 300, 350 degrees C upwards. So for 200 degrees C, there are much more uh, alternatives available in the market, which probably are also um, uh, economically uh, situated a bit better than a high temperature energy storage for low temperature energy use cases. Um, as for the insulation, insulation is for us one of the key topics in each project. So we did not design a standard insulation, let's say for 1000 degrees C, 72 hours then still time, because it's probably wrong in all the use cases we do have, maybe just one that hits it exactly. Um, so we de do design the insulation from project to project. Um, our remark is mostly focused on uh, what type of project is it? Is it a CapEx project? So let's say industries like steel, which have enough waste heat at the end, where one, two, three percent losses don't really take into account uh, that much, but the price of a storage system is more taken into account. Uh, then we are calculating usually between two and three percent of losses every day. So standard insulations like uh, silicon insulation, for example, or uh, uh, silicon um, uh, yeah, variations of this. And in other projects, especially net zero heat, where we re replace gas or other fossils against renewables, we minimize the losses best possible at the moment is 0.5% losses every day. It's much more expensive. It's a sandwich construction made of, I think, four different uh, insulation materials, but it's highly efficient. Okay, thank you for your additional remarks and explanations. Maybe one question that uh, could be a follow-up to, to you, Martin. Um, because you just mentioned the the different um, requirements, capex, opex. So, in general, do you face challenges challenges when financing your projects, or maybe more specific, what are the the main challenges in in financing your your projects? Um, so, first of all, the main challenges in the market really changed uh, tremendously within the last two years. Uh, when we talked to customers, let's say three years ago, um, there were let's say not that much educated what the high temperature energy storage is. So first of, first of all, you had to explain what's the difference between 120 degrees C hot water storage and the high temperature energy storage. And then start the discussion about uh, the, the, the different use cases. Uh, at that point in time, everybody was thinking about prototypes and pilots. Uh, meanwhile, um, the companies, the corporates uh, take the next step and say, no, we have to decarbonize today. We cannot wait till the pilot phase for five years finished. We have to go to full scale um, at the moment. And there are different um, subsidy programs available. Unfortunately, in Germany, um, yeah, it, it, it's a pity. We are still looking for and everything is benchmarked against hot water storage, uh, things like this. So the buffer is 
not the very best options on the European level. Um, it's it's quite amazing what type of um, uh, programs are available over there. Uh, subsidy programs, um, not only from let's say on on the governmental part, but also from uh, breakthrough energy catalysts uh, that that is supporting a large scale first of its kind project, uh, which is a very good um, uh, program uh, I mentioned. And there are also other financing solutions in the market. So you can find uh, sustainability finance companies uh, like like Suzy Partners or some more, or even let's say traditional financing partners. But usually. And I think they are also moving at the moment. Usually they, they want to have five, six, 10, 20 installations already operating for a couple of years before they invest in it. But uh, we can see also the pressure from the customer side to open it to newer solutions, although with a higher risk. So yeah, it's tricky, but there are options available you can take, but depends also on the project, on the type of project. But if I understand you right, it's, it's also one of your duties to come to the customer and have some some uh, yeah some appropriate ideas on how to finance the the system so the customer is usually not aware of suitable programs uh it depends on the customer can, can, cannot put everything into one bucket mm. you have you have smaller smaller uh, customer segments let's say uh, family owned businesses smes or small small businesses which do not really um have insights into to different uh, subsidies, into funding options. You have the corporates, on the other hand, which are mm -hmm. quite broad with a quite broad setup uh, and something in between. So you, as I said, you cannot put everything into one bucket, but it's good to know the, the funding opportunities for each country, uh, of course. And that's what we try to take into account when we go to a customer. What we also can see, uh, and that's quite, quite interesting, there are a couple of customers and I think they are right somehow, and there should be a little bit more pressure on the governments saying, I would love to have uh, funding. I would love to have a financing for this project, but it's far way too complicated to apply for it. And I do have to wait for another half year or a year till I get uh, the, the, the go or the no-go. Um, that's nothing for us. We have to find other solutions. I see. I see. Thanks. Um, so now looking at the Q&A uh, box, I think... Three questions to Norma. Uh, two on um, the use of waste heat. So you mentioned it's not yet done uh, utilizing the waste heat at the e farm project. Uh, am I right? So, but maybe you can report a bit on um, yeah the waste heat utilization in the households and um, what kind of um, what kind of heat grid is used to do so. Yeah, so um, we're actually using the heat already in Bospur at the production ah, okay. site. We are using uh, the heat from the electrolyzer already to um, um, to uh, provide for the municipality. I don't know what kind of grid is used, <laughs> but um, I think it's about forty thousand households we can uh, we can deliver with heat. Um, yeah, exactly. And uh, the other question was. Uh, similar, thing? yeah. The number of households um, yeah. that already use waste heat, and the second one was about the grid. Yeah, if it's a low uh, X grid for the heat transport. Um, again, a, a, a rather technical question. So, exactly. <laughs> so, let's say that there is a grid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there is there is another business unit in in the Gipi Drew uh, Group um, focusing mm -hmm. on heating systems. And uh, they are uh, responsible for the project in Bospul. Um, If you want to know more about that, I can definitely give the contact of a colleague of mine. And um, yeah, it's definitely also another very interesting business unit to look at. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for sharing this. Oh, but maybe to the temperatures. I, I see the question now. Um, mm -hmm. What is the what is the temperature? So. Um, since we use a PEM electrolyzer, um, it's not that um, high temperature of the heat, but it's enough for um, for the communal heating systems. I think it's around 60 to 70 degrees that um, is the return temperature. Okay. Uh, yeah, that answers uh, another question on the type of technology. So it's a PEM electrolyzers you're using. Uh, are you using different... Um, systems from different companies manufacturers testing different PEM electrolyzers yeah or? well 
We started with um, a company that uh, was actually a kind of a startup um, we we raised, <laughs> let's uh, put it like that. Uh, so the HTEC electrolyzers were developed um, during the time they were still part of the GPJO group. We then uh, sold them to MIN Energy Solutions. Um, and we still have a couple of the HTEC electrolyzers in use, but now, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we actually um, made that contract with another electrolyzer supplier, which is H2B2. It's a Spanish, Spanish company um, doing the electrolyzers. So yeah, okay. there are definitely def different Thanks. systems in use. Okay, looking at the time, um... We are already um, facing the lunch break, at least in uh, the European time zone. Um, as we have one final question, I would uh, say that that's okay to to uh, to address this one. There's a <laughs> Herbert has a second one. So maybe Herbert, um, if you raise your hand, you can choose which of the two questions you um, you post. So I give you the, uh, the speech. Um, Capabilities. Let me see how well, to do this. Or Steffi, can you assist? Oh yeah, now. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, um, I'll keep it uh, short. Um, maybe I'll ask one of the question private and the other one over here. Um, the question. Uh, yeah. Maybe on the impact test network. Um, is it possible to say a bit more on the actual developments at the moment? So um, what is the trend in the number of participating PhD students? How many PhD students do you presently have? Which countries are most active? Is it possible to give a bit more feeling on this? Yeah, thank you for your question. <clears throat> well, actually, currently we have uh, PhD students enrolled in the platform that come mainly from the network itself so we what have you, yeah. from from italy from the perugia mm -hmm. university from calabria also mm -hmm. we receive a lot of um, yeah request uh, requests to to register students there we mm -hmm. also have students from our own from Lleida, from spain mm -hmm. And but yeah, there are some other institutions, some other countries that are not so active in this field. Yeah. So, and um, yeah, because I, I, and how many PhD students do you have at the moment? So you aim for 28, but is this is the trend in the right direction or how are things going? Well, no, I, I don't think we, we reach that trend in, in, in PhD students that enroll because mm -hmm. I'll, uh, because. Since we don't have this PhD, this joint PhD program, now what we are doing is co tells and these co tells it's well an alternative, but yeah, we we are not able to reach that number, that high number. Okay, yeah. So it's maybe around ten or so per year. Per okay, year. right, and mainly from Italy and Spain at the moment. I understand. Yes, yes. Actually, we have today one PhD student in Cotutel from that did in Portugal and Italy, and he is defending the, the PhD today. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, nice. Yeah. yeah. Thank okay. You. Well, thank you for this insight. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, thank you. With this, I'd like to close the uh, session, this morning session of the second day of the Anastock online conference.